Welcome to the third lecture of principles of vibration control. Now, in the last lecture, I was telling you about the steps in vibration control that you have to keep in your mind. I would like to elaborate that little more. So, if you remember that the first step I said is the identification and characterization of the source of vibration. And then the second stage is that you have to specify the level to which this vibration should be reduced. And thirdly, you have to choose the method out of the five different techniques that I, we have discussed earlier. And then fourthly, you have to prepare an analytical design based on this method, which we will be actually discussing in this course. Finally, you have to realize it in practice, that of course, we did not discuss here but you know you have to do some hardware mechanization in terms of actually implementing the whole thing. So, in the step A if I elaborate it a little more, then the step A is telling that identify and characterize the source of vibration. That means, you have to do a source characterization that is very very important because we always try to find out that what is the frequency content in a vibration if it is periodic vibration. If it is not a periodic random vibration that also will come out and accordingly we have to take a strategy. Let us say if we take on a harmonic excitation a pure single frequency harmonic excitation in the time history signal and we carry out a fast Fourier transform we will get only one peak which would mean that it is containing the signal is containing only one natural frequency of the system which is most probably the resonating frequency of the system and then we will be very lucky because we have to design the system modification only around that particular frequency. But many a times we would not be that lucky, we will still get a periodic excitation, it need not be at a single frequency of course, something like a saw wave which will be having actually many many such peaks. So, that means you have to actually design for your damping system or vibration control system for various frequencies, not for one frequency. Sometimes it can be a narrow band random excitation. That means, instead of a short peak you will get a band okay, in this type of signals you will get a band in which you have to actually control the vibration of the system. And sometimes it can be actually random broadband. That means, the spectrum is like pretty flat in nature, okay. something like you know uh, in terms of uh, say one real application could be that uh, when the rocket is launched in the launching pad, the launching pad will be subjected to a broadband random excitation. So, which means you have to adopt uh, suitable you know control strategies, because you see uh, your material if it is only tuned at a one single frequency, it will not be effective in this case. So, it has to be such that many frequencies or so to say a, a wide band of frequency, it should be able to be sensitive to that. So, accordingly you have to choose your strategy in terms of vibration control method. So, that is the source characterization. Next of course, is that what is the suitable response variable and what is the accepted level of vibration. This needs a little bit of experience. Of course, if you do not have experience to begin with, you use the so called you know handbooks, uh, various types of handbooks are there. So, you use the handbooks you know the uh, vibration uh, control handbooks uh, that are available in libraries. So, if you do that, you will see that corresponding to different types of applications like suppose if it is hand tools. What is the acceleration permissible? It will be something like 5 meter per second square. If it is drill, it is much more because it is uh, you know is actually handled uh, in a very rough atmosphere. So, it is much higher. If it is something like a grinder, it is much lower 1 to 3 meter per second square. 
if it is vehicle then also it is much lower it is about 1.15 meter per second square if it is an excavator it is 1 to 5 meter per second square if it is a terrain vehicle it is about 3 to 5 meter per second square so thus depending on the application the handbook will tell you what is the safe acceptable level of vibration so that means when you are taking up the job of vibration control at that point of time whatever is your level of acceleration the moment you are bringing it down below this level you are safe and that means your design is over so this is what we carry out at step b next is step c where you actually choose a method of vibration control now if you remember in the very first class i have talked about such methods five such methods one is uh, excitation reduction at the source itself the other one is system modification another one is source isolation then you have active control where you are actually taking the response of the system into consideration and then also the last one in which you use response as a source of excitation and convert mechanical energy to electrical energy so that is the step c where you are choosing a method of vibration control then of course you have to carry out a kind of a analytical design and then you have to do the hardware this we will discuss you know as we will be proceeding in this particular course now i have discussed about many of the control strategies but not so much about active vibration control maybe in this introductory sessions i will talk a little bit about it so in the case of active vibration control as you can see that this is suppose an incoming vibration then the cancellation signal is actually exactly uh, you know same in terms of the magnitude but opposite in terms of the phase if this is positive this is negative uh, as a result they are actually cancelling each other as you can see and there is a zero net effect that you are getting out of it that is what theoretically we try to achieve in active vibration control what do you need for it well you need quite a few things suppose if this is the test structure you first need to measure the response of the test structure many a times we do this with the help of a sensor which is known as accelerometer it actually measures the acceleration of the system and then there is a conditioning amplifier which actually throw away all the noises and it comes to a dual channel analyzer or a pc for that matter then also you sense another thing which is the level of force that is exciting the system through a force transducer that also can come through a signal conditioning and come to this dual channel analyzer now based on this and a computer based model software you determine that what will be your uh, cancellation type of the signal that is this part of the signal you determine at this stage so once you do it then what you do you use a power amplifier because the nature of signal is known now you have to increase the power with that you drive a vibration exciter that vibration exciter drives the force transducer again and that actually nullifies the whole thing so that's the closed loop strategy in terms of a closed loop system if you look at it then you may say that maybe i have a reference signal in mind some cases this reference may be zero some cases it may be up to an acceptable level and then you have a controller point and you have a plant that you are driving like using the force transducer you are driving the test structure so the controller is driving this gs and there can be some disturbances which you wish or not is coming into the system you are measuring the response which is full of all these things that is what you are measuring through the accelerometer and then that is coming to another gain which you are deciding here in the computer and with that you are feeding it back to the system here okay so and that is your power amplifier to the force transducer route whatever is happening here so that actually closes the whole loop and you do it in such a manner that if you do it for some time then gradually the vibration comes down 
to the tolerable level. So, that is the strategy of active vibration control. There are many applications of this active vibration control. One such application is the vibration and shape control of flexible systems like optical mirror. This is of course, having you know two applications, one is in space application and another is in uh, MEMS type of systems. Now, here the point is that we are looking for a very, very high precision shape control. So, if we have a, you know a kind of a silicon wafer which is polished in such a manner that you have it can uh, you know work like a beautiful uh, kind of a reflector. Now, this at the back of it you have this hexagonal piezoelectric actuator. This piezoelectric actuator they work in a very interesting way that if you apply the voltage in this piezoelectric actuator they change their shape and as they change their shape they are trying to do that they will take the silicon wafer along that and as a result the entire lens is going to change its shape. So, you can see here that once you are actuating with the PZT actuator how this change in shape is happening. Now, this the good part of piezoelectric actuator is that it works in a very, very high bandwidth almost up to gigahertz level which means that it reacts very fast and also the stroke requirement is quite low here. So, you do not have to deform too much, but you have to deform very, very accurately which is what this piezoelectric actuator are very good of. So, thus you can control the aperture and also you can control the vibrations in such flexible systems. So, that is one application of active vibration control. The other application is also having a space application. This is with respect to the deep space observatories. As you all know that the Hubble telescope has kind of you know overlived its lifetime. So, the time has come for us to have a new telescopic system which can be used in terms of observing the universe beyond you know our solar systems to the far away areas of the universe. Now, to do that this is a future interferometric mission I am talking about. Here no longer we will be using one single telescope rather we will be using multiple such telescopes. So, you can see many such telescopes looking at small, small areas of the space and now what you are doing? You are taking the signals from each one of them and you are assembling them all together at one single point such that the error because the moment the signal is traveling these paths there will be some error. The error has to be in the nanometer level such is the tolerance level so tight and the pointing error of individual telescope is about also in the nano radian level. To do that we take help of two things. One is for the path correction we use a kind of a delay line so that all the signals will come almost at the same time. So, by suitably changing the position of the mirror we can do this path correction. So, that if something is coming fast we can tell it that hold on we will increase your path a little bit more. So, that you come almost at the same time when the slow one is coming. So, that you know the idea is that we should be looking at the universe at the same point of time all around it. Okay. There should not be any time delay between it. So, if something some signal some information reaches very fast to us we slow it down and if some reaches slow we tune it with the faster one. So, that we get a coherent single you know time picture of the universe. The second part is that so, this is a big flexible structure we are talking about that means, this large truss here this will be always having in a small bit of uh, perturbation you do it in the space it will start to continuously vibrate and if it vibrates then you cannot achieve your nanometer level of uh, you know accuracy in the optical path neither that pointing error of nano radian etcetera. So, you must have some system which will not allow this vibration from the large truss to go to this telescope part. To do that 
what is used is called an active Stuart platform, which is like a 6 degree of freedom isolated system. This isolator system may have piezoelectric actuators or terphenol D rod, which is another smart material or voice coil etcetera. Now, what does it do? What it does is that if there is a vibration that is coming to the base of the system that means here, then in order that this vibration would not reach this quiet optics region or it will be it will not be coming up to this level, what you have to do is that these particular legs you have to control their stiffness, mass etcetera such that the vibration signal does not reach there. So, how do I control the stiffness? Well, by changing the leg length, you can control the stiffness by making it taller, you will make it flexible, by making it shorter, you will make it stiffer. How do I change the length of each one of this link? Well, piezoelectric actuators precisely do that. If you apply a voltage, the piezoelectric actuator will expand or contract depending on the direction of the voltage and hence you can control the stiffness and hence you can control the pathway, so that this vibration does not reach the quiet region. That is the principle of active you know Stuart platform. Essentially if you look at it that it works something like a low pass filter, so that you know whatever is the low frequency part content in the signal does not allow that uh, and the rest of the things you know uh, may get transmitted to the system. So, it transmits the low frequency attitude which is the control torque but all the high frequency disturbances it actually you know stops that. So, that is what is uh, another application of active vibration control. Now, we will talk about a system modification which is in terms of detuning and decoupling. This is a system modification concept and we must look into it at length. So, what is detuning? Well, we know that excitation or operating close to natural frequency will create resonance and consequently you will get a large amplitude of vibration of the system. So, hence it is always desirable to keep the natural frequency of the system away from the excitation frequency of the system. So, this you know by suitably changing the parameters like mass, stiffness etcetera, this is known as detuning of the system. Suppose, if I take a single degree of freedom system of a uh, like a you know this kind of a system which has a mass m and uh, it has a spring suppose here fixed at one point and this is a frictionless wheel system, this is k. So, the omega n is square root of k by m. That is the natural frequency of the system. Now, if I am exciting it at a frequency f sin omega t, in order to keep this omega separate from omega n, so that the resonance does not occur, when omega is not in our hand, but omega n is in our hand. So, we will be either increasing the stiffness or we will be you know changing the mass of the system. So, either by changing the stiffness of the mass, we can keep this omega n away from omega. So, that is what is the strategy of detuning a particular system. Now, there is one beautiful example of this. This is the example of the Tacoma Narrows suspension bridge that you all know. This bridge opened in July 1, 1940. And you know, soon after that, the bridge collapsed. The bridge collapsed on November 7, 1940. The reason is aeroelastic flutter. Well, this is of course you know a very complicated thing, but uh, just to uh, kind of uh, you know tell you the essence of it is that the bridge was designed in such a manner that there is a kind of a vortex induced vibration that has happened when the bridge was getting excited by a wind speed of about 68 kilometer per hour. And as this vortex induced vibration 
you know the natural frequency of the system was pretty close. You will see the torsional frequency of the system later on. So, as this coupling occurred, so the system started to go for a large response. As the large response happens, then there will be this arrow elastic coupling that will happen to the system and there will be a flutter that will start and that would result in the collapse of the system. Let us look into how this system would behave. Now, you have seen that how Takuma Naro's bridge has collapsed. In fact, uh, then you know the bridge is redesigned and it was reopened in October 14, 1950. And in this new configuration, they have not used this old girder system, rather they have used open spaces here. So, one of the reason is that there was a lift force development at the base of the girder which was actually exciting the whole system. Now, this time this pressure gradient would not be developing because the wind can pass through this open section. So, they have taken care of that and also they have designed it in such a manner that it would not get excited by those kinds of vortex induced vibrations. So, the changes and further of course, later on in 2007 another parallel bridge also has been opened on the same spot. So, we learn from a catastrophe. So, this was the original you know section of the garden and this is uh, having a modified design as I told you which has the side trusses were lowered and tied at the bottom end by a horizontal truss. So, that this new design is torsionally stiffer because you have this kind of a instead of a open cross section, you have a closed cross section. So, that means in terms of torsional excitation a this is stiffer. So, it would not get excited the fundamental torsional natural frequency exceeds the excitation frequency generated even by a high wind speed. So, thus you can say that the bridge was detuned from the excitation frequencies. So, that is one strategy that we always take in terms of detuning. The other strategy that we take is known as decoupling. Now, this is very interesting that in an assembly process an atom should be always made such that the natural frequencies of the various components and the assembly itself are actually detuned from each other. So, this technique of you know reducing the number of coupled resonators is called decoupling. In a way you can think of it that suppose you have a single pendulum system a series of single pendulums. Now, once they are isolated from each other then you know there is no problem, but if these pendulums are actually linked by a very weak you know spring or stiffness what happens then is that it behaves like a coupled resonator. That means, you excite at one point here suppose and this excitation will reach the next and this will reach the next and thus you know all the system will start to behave. There are many things that can happen including chaos in the system once you have such kind of a coupled resonator. So, the decoupling intends to cut these kind of you know weak coupling between the systems. So, that is what is the you know essence of the decoupling system. So, this is what is the essence of the decoupling system that when using any such method it should be ensured of course, that the new natural frequencies are normal more harmful than the original natural frequency of the system. Now, there is a very good application of this concept in aircraft structure. In any aircraft you know next time if you can see that how this aircraft the fuselage part of an aircraft. So, that means, that is the central part where the seats will be there right when where we all sit. So, here if you look at it then you will see that this is a shell like structure okay, all around. So, that is what is an aircraft you know wing etcetera. Now, if you look at it very closely you will see that this cell like structure is having some kind of a 
actually second layer in it. So, there is a this is the inside part of the cabin. Now, these are called stiffeners. The reason why we give stiffeners is that the effect of the vibration from the fuselage structure because you will be having the engines here, right. So, the engines will generate a lot of noise. These noises you do not want it to come inside the cabin region. In order to stop that, you give this kind of a stiffener structure, pretty much like what I have shown you in this, you know, woodpecker example. Now, what kind of a cross section I should actually choose in terms of the stinger? In order to decide that, we have to see that this kind of a structure can be actually you know made an abstraction that as if you have a continuous structure which have at every point a torsional stiffness and a bending stiffness. Torsional stiffness is like you know k r torsional stiffness and the bending stiffness is k t. Now, if you consider a small part of this, so that means instead of that repeated structure, you have a small part of it. That means, in this small part, you have this k t by 2, k t by 2 and you have these springs. Okay. In, uh, so, this is k r by 2, k r by 2 okay, and k t by 2, k t by 2. That means, I have just isolated only one part of it. Okay, there are many, many such units. So, I have taken half of it because it is a repeated structure. Now, in this structure, there are two different system of excitation. One is like this and another is like this. That is the torsion of the system. So, corresponding to each one, you have you know the stiffness or the spring stiffness is in place. As it happens for this type of systems, these you know transverse motions are going to give you the bending modes and these ones are going to give you the so called torsional modes of the system. Now, if the torsional modes and the bending modes are all present uh, you know in terms of if I look at the omega versus the response or amplitude of the system. So, the transfer function if I look at it and I may see that there are many, many peaks in it and some peaks here. So, what I want is that we want all the torsional peaks in one region and we want, we want all the torsional peaks, torsional frequencies and these are the bending frequencies and we want the bending frequencies to be separated. That means, decoupled. That means, there is some kind of a gap between the two. So, we should choose the, the, the strategy to do that is all there in terms of choosing the proper cross section of the stiffeners. If we choose something like a jet section, then what happens because it is an open section. So, it will give you a low torsional stiffness. So, you get all the torsional modes in a certain frequency band and because it has lot of material away from the neutral axis. So, it has a much higher you know uh, bending stiffness and as a result the bending frequencies are much higher. So, thus you are decoupling between the torsional mode and the bending mode. That means, if there is torsion you are ensuring there will be no bending also and vice versa. So, this is what is another very fine example of decoupling of the modes. Next is in terms of the tuned mass damper, here we are adding another sacrificial system. Okay. So, you can control the mass of the sacrificial system, the stiffness and the damping in such a manner that the primary system that vibration of that system comes down and the secondary system may get a large amplitude does not matter because you are sacrificing the secondary system thus you are saving the primary system. 
So, that is the concept of the tuned mass damper. We will talk about the mathematical part of it in much more detail in the future lectures about this. Now, this has got many beautiful applications like this tall and slender free structures like skyscrapers, bridges, chimneys. You will find in many cases in the top of it there is this kind of a large tuned mass damper okay, uh, that is put in these towers etcetera in the skyscrapers. Sometimes actually they do not even put it separately, but they put as I told you a big water tank on top of it and this water tank works like a, a secondary system which is attached to a skyscraper. So, this is an application in terms of you know a kind of a secondary system. So, this type A you know in the skyscraper you would see this kind of an application of a tuned mass damper system. So, this is where we will put an end and in the next lecture we will learn about various damping models. Thank you.